Hello there, thank you for staying with us and welcome to Newsnight. I'm Neota Igwe. Now, poor governance in Nigeria has long been a significant impediment to the nation's growth and development. This issue is multifaceted, encompassing corruption, inadequate public services, and political instability. Now, Political instability, characterized by frequent leadership changes and ethnic tensions, create an uncertain environment for both domestic and foreign investors. This uncertainty deters long-term investment and stifles economic growth. My guest believes that addressing poor governance, political stability and inclusivity are vital for building a more prosperous and equitable future for all Nigerians. Newsnight sat down with a political economist, Professor Obiora Okonkwo. Uh, Professor Okonkwo, if I may call you Professor Okonkwo. <laughs> thank You're you. right, thank, thank you. Thank you for speaking to us on Newsnight. It's my pleasure. Um, we'll start off real quick. You grew up an entrepreneur. I mean, mm -hmm. while in school, you were involved. You went through the apprenticeship scheme. So you understand starting small and going big. Mm -hmm. So let's start off from that side of unemployment in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. For one who's studied the system and what do you think is the issue? How can this be sorted out one time? Well, you, you, I, I think you have done your research properly well. Because sometimes I was a student apprentice. You know, those days in growing up, if you were a male child, if your father is a barber, if your father is a, you, you go to shop at the end of school with him. If he's a driver, you are his conductor when you're out of school. If he's a mechanic, you go to his mechanic workshop. That was how trades and certain knowledge of life were passed on to us. Then in my own case, my father was a trader in our nature main market. So at the end of every school day, I go to him and then he, he got sick at a very early age of his life. At, at the age of 50, he had stroke, and I was then 14 in class three. And then I had to start overseeing the business, the, the business with all apprentices. So I've been, I've been around for a while. So then what do you see in that art was a time where a lot of people were engaged, and that is the apprenticeship, a boy. And I... I agree with you that today, either that a whole lot of people are looking for white collar jobs or they are looking for quick fix for issue of money in this situation we are now. That was why some time ago, I got really concerned and I started putting in the front burner the issue of apprenticeship, the bad boy, what happened? So much so that I had to give a grant to UNISIC, Namdazigwe University of Oka to research what went wrong. How, when did we, how did we start this about boy? What went wrong in, the, in, the, in between? And why, how suddenly have we found ourselves in this situation, especially the youth mm. from the Southeast? Because I believe that solving employment issue Mentorship is important. There must be mentors, there must be mentees. Mm. But you see, and it has to be done today in a way that it has to fit into the trends of the time. Those days might be the old ways. Today, you know, mentorship could be even from being a cameraman, it could be being IT person and so on and so forth. So the economy we have today is being challenged and we need to think out of the box to find a situation to that. So in the area of <coughs> employment, especially the youth unemployment, um, <coughs> um, is not just enough. When the economy is not growing, it will be affecting jobs. Mm -hmm. When the individuals who, are, who have their businesses are struggling, it will affect growth. And when these things are happening, eventually people will lose their job businesses will not expand and then when there are multiple taxes it put pressure on the business let's look at the growth of businesses here um why does it look like why do you say businesses are not growing or imply that businesses are not growing i mean the government at different levels will tell you that they are doing all they can they've put out the right policies but 
still, what is the real challenge with the growth of businesses in Nigeria? The last eight years have really been very, very hectic. I, I was once a, a, a diaspora and one of the brain games you see today. Coming back to Nigeria in the year 2005 to start my business, I've seen great economic growth. The banking sector, recapitalizing businesses, having multi-billion businesses and so on and so up to the time of Jonathan. I am a living witness that I've seen Nigerians living overseas, mortgaging their properties, coming in with a million or two million dollars starting business. I know at that point, banks will come to you and say, we don't want your deposit. We mm -hmm. just want you to show us which business to put money. I know when the banks were saying, we don't want to take dollar cash deposit, our votes, we are closed, you know, we, can, we don't have anywhere to put money. Okay. So businesses were booming. We've seen banks, Nigerian businesses going overseas, offering our Nigerian nationals more money than they were earning in America and London, and they were relocating to Nigeria. All roads led to Nigeria. Until the last eight, nine years, it became the opposite. <laughs> so, you were a living witness. Investors started running away, economies started shrinking, started lacking foreign exchange in the in the in the forex market, Naira started losing value, things are getting complicated. I think they were just simply obviously within that period the world economy suffered some great shock, recessions. Within eight eight years of the last administration, we had about two two recessions. That's unprecedented. You know, we must not have gone through whatever the world goes through. Countries like Russia were they was able to isolate themselves and few other countries. So um, I really think that um, it has been a policy somersault, inconsistency, and non-clarity. Those some of the statements of the government were not made bearing in mind the effect it could have in the business environment. The fight for corruption became took a different dimension. That so much so that people started running out of the country and getting scared. This affected businesses. Mm -hmm. And expecting that new administration will start on a different note, well, it's still too early. There are some signs that, that business oriented and, and have business progress in mind, but that's only uh, in, 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 in intention. We haven't seen that translate to action on the ground. So businesses are still weak and um, I, 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 am, I am very hopeful that maybe this government will get their ass together quickly because it's hard for us to wake up in the morning. You have one billion naira that could have been two million dollars is, 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 is one million dollars, especially for people like us who are in aviation and the aviation currency is dollar, US dollar. So mm -hmm. you, you rate yourself in how much dollar what you can generate in naira we provide for you and you know 100% of our, our local operators, 100% of our energy are in Naira mm. and we are faced with conversion. So when you even have this Naira, you don't have access to foreign exchange. You know, when you don't have access to foreign exchange, it affects your time and affects your obligations to your own our partners, the vendors, and then you start losing some credibility. That's really quite uh, what we're going through here. Okay, so if we step back a bit. Um, so the last administration, the last eight, nine years, you talked about policy somersault yeah. and the fight against corruption. Yeah. Now, there are those who will say it all began with the, the administration before. That. That's a good luck, Jonathan, administration. Mm -hmm. So they just came in to do a cleanup of what was, to clean the mess. Is it that the cleaning wasn't properly done or the business environment did not understand the direction the government was going? If I have to put this in business perspective, I've seen people who take over a company that was there. Maybe they pick it for one dollar, they turn it around, and it becomes a conglomerate. So if you had come to pick up something that was alive, and by the time you are living, it was dead, that there was no, there was no, there was no, 
nothing to pick. They just came to kill something that was alive. So I don't agree with that. Mm. The, com the economy was vibrant, all right? The, we were, by the time they came in, Nigeria was the, the biggest economy in Africa. Our poverty index was low, unemployment was low, economy was strong, Naira was, uh, Naira value was great, you know, so unemployment was lower. So if you had come to, to if you think it was bad, assuming it was bad, as bad as it was, that's fine. By the time you are living, <laughs> we would have, you would have doubled the economy, but you shrunk it. You would have strengthened the value of Naira, especially in the wake of the fact that we don't have, we are not competing so much with exports and we don't have tourism because that's the only way we would have benefited from lower Naira value. If you have a strong export product or services, if you have a whole lot of, uh, a whole lot of, um, Influence. tourists coming okay. into the country, then would have been benefiting. We don't have anything to benefit except that, you know, people people are losing their So are you considering problems. the fact that issues like um, the insurgency came in, the insecurity from left, right, back, and center, and some of it from the neighboring areas? Are you considering that that may have been a major challenge to the government to even expand the economy, as you say? Well, um, I'm aware that there was insurgency before the last government came in, and um, it was being contained. At least we know at that point in time, it was just in a small portion of uh, of uh, northeast. And with this, with that, this government is spread. You know, so those are also part of the uh, the wrong outcome of uh, bad approach to issues. So. The issue of insurgency has been there. Mm -hmm. So if it has been a part of effect, maybe, but it's an internal issue. They were part of the problem they were supposed to solve. But from every indication, and all the reports are available, both openly and, and internally, and things, more of things I know I may not have to say here, that didn't seem to be a clear direction that that showed commitment, sincerity, and political way to 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 go head on mm. with that insurgent. So, so um, I think it was a self-inflicted uh, situation with the last government. Okay, they could have dealt with it better. Okay, so now we are where we are. This is a new administration. So let's look at the political climate here. How would that? How is the political climate, and how is it weighing against the economy? Well. Right now, we have a very tense political climate due to the fact that the, the last national election was fiercely contested. Before now, you probably have a contest between two so strong major, ruling yeah. parties and then weak opposition. So you can easily predict the outcome. But now it was like, like a three and a half way race. So it was fiercely contested and it's evident in the composition in the National Assembly. And then obviously, we are not yet out of election season because uh, judiciary has become an integral part of our election, uh, our election process. So until everything about judiciary is wrapped up and concluded, the election when they still blowing. So it is still tense. And then when a, an incumbent is in this kind of a situation. There's no doubt that every step they take has to be very wary of of what is still yet to come. So you are right; it could still be part of the issues. But um, on the other hand, <laughs> I've also seen a situation where somebody has seen himself in this kind of political uh, uncertainty. And the person just puts his head right inside the job. And then the outcome is so much that uh, even people who didn't believe, you know, in the outcome would, would be saying, oh, uh, well, why do we really have to bother? We're getting the results of, um, we're getting a better result from this. Let anything happen. So it could be that way, mm -hmm. but 
But by and large, it, it wouldn't be the same if everything is fully finalized. So I ask this question because um, we do know that when uh, President Tinubu, at his inaugural speech, he just re echoed what had already been done, removal of pet subsidy on petrol. Mm. That had its ripple effect. Yeah. And we've seen that the, the effects of that on and on. And we see the different measures being made, palliatives here, palliatives there. But I want to take us to the United Nations General Assembly and some of the statements that the president has made and some of the meetings he has held pointing to the fact that Nigeria, indeed, one of the statements he made yesterday, the world will ignore Nigeria to its peril. Those are very strong uh, words. But looking at it from that political economic side, what do you think, how do you think that will play out in terms of FDIs and tourism back in Nigeria? Well, um, he was saying the obvious. There's no doubt that Africa is the next destination and Nigeria supposedly is the giant of Africa. But I believe that it's time we come out of words and put it into actions. Um, we wouldn't be telling the world we're here only by mouth. We should do that by action. A country of 200 and something million people with all the natural resources were in doubt. So a president, knowing those facts, should say such a thing with all sense of, you know, responsibility and authority. I agree. And that's our prayer that these things could be translated into action here so that the world will come looking for us. We have also seen that. You know, what you say in a podium during political campaign is not the same as a candidate. But when you are in a position of authority, every word that comes out of your mouth matters. So at that inauguration, when Mr. President says X, Y, Z, you see the ripple effect. But if you was campaigning, nobody would have just paid any attention, somebody would say, oh, it's just not so then they talk, <laughs> you know. So the powers of a president, the words of a president can rock the, the stock exchange. Somebody in authority. So I only hope that, you know, being a new government, they will realize the powers and authority around both the spoken, unspoken words of somebody in office, and then also, in the same manner, that said one or two things, even without acting, that is having a ripple effect on the economy. I wish they can also think of how to position these words to give the hope that we need now. Matching words and action. Yes, that we start affecting the economy positively before they will have time now to readjust. Because it's to our own interest that everything goes well, irrespective of who is in office. We, the people who are doing our thing, just want economy that is strong, we want policy that is consistent, and we want the outcome that is, um, is beneficial to everybody. But if, if you're going to um, look at the kind of action that should be taken vis-a-vis -vis the last eight, nine years, to into this year, the words have come forward, real strength. Indeed, the, the, it looks like the world economy is looking right now, okay, Nigeria, Nigeria is speaking through its president. What's the action? What should Nigerian businesses, mark the word here now, not just the government, what should Nigerian businesses be doing in preparation for that inflow that's likely to come? Because people will be looking for, okay, are there partners there? Nigerian government has said, we are open for business. We are open to take you in. We are ready for you. But are the people ready? Oh, yes. I, I can assure you that Nigeria is ready. For those, anybody who has survived the last eight years in Nigeria is more than ready. Because a whole lot of people couldn't. Factories, big factories were selling off, they're packing up. Families, individuals, we are living in Nigeria. So for anybody with his two legs standing in Nigeria, that is more than ready even to take 
worst situation. So we are ready. Um, we'll just hope that we should not be made worse than we are now because mm -hmm. there is a limitation to, to endurance. You can only stress somebody to, to some extent. But however, um, we want those businesses opportunities to come into Nigeria in real terms, not just in words. But it's not only what that will bring them. We need to get a house in order. We need to tidy up a couple of things. We need to have policy consistency. We need to, we need to deal with the issues that had to do with really where our resources. What are, are those areas when you say we need to tidy up our household? What are those things that need to be tidied up? Maybe in specific terms. You see, we um, the government of the day has to tie tie some loopholes. There are so many stories about where our money is always turned into money from the the the, the, the crude, which is our major our major issues. Um, we need to tidy that up. I don't I don't tell you I know the details, but there are concerns that um, a lot of earnings are not clear where they're going. Our physical and monetary policy. We hope with the new minister of of uh, finance and then the, the central the, bank the, the central bank incoming that is coming you will be able to be transparent and actually come up with policies that will stabilize the the, the financial environment um, and at the same time the national assembly itself we have to look at things the budgeting system is very very critical um, uh, the, the, the government, the state government should also rise up to the, to the occasion because from the recent uh, distributions from the FARC, we, uh, before now we've been seeing the FARC sharing 600 billion, 300 billion, 400 billion, and then the trillions. So going to the trillions means that a whole lot more of resources are going to the states. But surprisingly, we don't hear much of what is happening instead. Everybody is still talking about what is happening in Cambodia, what the federal government is doing, and so on and so forth. These things must have to trickle down. I believe in a system of bottom-up. Most of the local governments we have in the states are not fully functional because there are no elected executives who have the autonomy to get their resources and start implementing. If there is a short ba -ba -ba in my village, everybody is saying Nigeria. It shouldn't be Nigeria. It should, it should be the local government chairman who is in charge of that place. It should be the monarch. It should be the town union leaders. So we look so much up to the port. So that also brings to the issue that probably something that was really, really on the foot burner during the campaign had to do with what kind of system do we really work for us. Is this powerful presidential system in the center what we really need? Or is it time we go back to what had proven effective in this system, the true federalism? I'm surprised I'm, I don't see actions or even discussions on that now because from the way it was such an issue during the election, I was thinking that the next president, even before inaugurating the National Assembly, would have had a bill you know, uh, ready to put in about really dissolving the powers in the center and giving more to the regions and all that. And even the first executive uh, response duty would have been anything within that issue of dissolution of power that are within the executive order would have been signed up. That was what I was expecting. But <laughs> strangely, it has, it has vanished from our even discourse or thought process. So I really think that these are part of the issues. Anything that this government has to do for less attention, less concentration in the center, and then the people, the led, also should know who to hold accountable. The last time I understand that they, in fact, they distributed about 1.5 or 6 trillion naira, nobody's even talking about it. And we're still looking at what the CBM will do, what a minister, what magic can somebody who was just who had just been sworn in, what does what does even the person know? 
still struggling to grasp to grab the situation, but the action should be in the state. So the ripple effects of a good state governance, local government administration, could also mop up a whole lot of unemployment within their zone, and then a little will be left at the federal center. And then if businesses are going on well in local government level, in state level, some states have actually done very well. Let go state, if you go there, you know, a, whole, a lot of business activities are going on. One would have expected. I mean, I've seen a whole lot of increase in business activities and economic growth in a state like Delta, in a city like uh, Asaba. Life has become really quite active. So we want to see a lot more of that in different states. Mm -hmm. That will reduce the pressure from the center and then engage more people and create economic activities. Let's look at a question of infrastructure. We, you talked about it. Do we have the infrastructure for this influx of FDI? Is it physical infrastructure and uh, not so physical infrastructure. For instance, roads. That talks to transportation. Do we have the infrastructure? We may not have it. But it's from my own experience and what I know. If we have other things right, the prospects are good. These FDIs that are coming, they come with everything. They provide the infrastructure. The people we saw in the early days, the oil explorers and all that, did we give them anything? They saw the oil, they need to exploit it for their own benefit, they provided themselves what they wanted. What infrastructure did we have? But there was no light, they put light. When the colonial masters came, did we build the roads that brought them in? <laughs> we didn't. So the, the, the bigger thing is for the prospects to be there. If the prospects are not there, they come work with us, providing, and they can call it corporate social responsibility to build the roads, <laughs> to provide the light, to get to where they, they want to get to for the benefits uh, that they have seen that, that, will, that will come out of it. So I don't really think so, that that should be the word. But do we have it? We don't have it all the time. And the issue of infrastructure does not have an end. It's continually uh, growing. If you go to many cities, major cities in the world, be in America or UK or ancient cities that have been there for 2,000 years. Paris, you see con continuous activities of works, infrastructures, those that have it, they're extending it, they're upgrading it. So we don't just have to have it. To, that should not be the attraction because the people are capable of providing for it. The larger thing is have a a good business environment, mm. where there is security, where there is ease of business, where there is government that is serious and business friendly, and then um, the rest will flow. But even though we have governors forums in Southeast governors forums, South South governors forums, can they come together, have these conversations, and we see things being done regionally? Well, let's hope that. Uh, I, I hope they understand that. If, if they do understand that, they need to know that there should be a regional system to have regional economic strength. The budget of some of these states are very, very minor, that they cannot embark on huge infrastructural development, all right? Because the internal generated revenue are poor, and some of these projects are huge projects. And until they come together as a region and put resources together then and have their own counterpart fund that will be attractive to any infrastructural uh, lender because this money can just not be easily available. And for that interest, infrastructural lender, you sh they should be able to see the prospect of the impact of that infrastructural development in the economy to increase the, the revenue of those regions to be able to pay back because these things don't come by grant, you know. And uh, so it's something that must have to come from deliberate policy, uh, uh, sincere, consistent commitment from both to, to be able to achieve that. So mm -hmm. infrastructure is very important, but it cannot be done 
purely on commercial basis. Okay. Yeah. Uh, when you say that, what do you, what do you imply? What commercial basis is that you need to source the funds. Some of these funds have cost, you know, and you need to present the visibility that the business plan that you have, you have the capacity to pay by. It's not like grant, go use it and, and then forget about it, no. So you must be able to put it together. And you know, for me, it, it, until the governors understand actually that the strength of that office is not about contract they're able to award, you know, or favors they're able to dispense to their friends and cronies, but knowing that a government office has so much power that all you need to do is to bring brain power into it and then think of huge and big projects. You know what I mean? That that you need to now put on paper and that you will look bankable. Mm -hmm. All right? Because everything in this world starts with idea. Idea is actually what the world is. It's not money. The so-called fintech we're talking about and uh, the Microsoft of this world, the Facebook of this world, and their likes. These are people, they did not inherit huge uh, family money. It's just the ideas put on paper, all right, and then seeing people coming around to make that work. For me, it's about idea. It starts with idea. And as much as we look at ourselves in Nigeria as a country that has high cost of, of funds, 26 point something percent in in, 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 in interest rate, I am aware there are still so many countries of the world that have huge funds. Their problem is where do they invest it? Because in such countries, deposit rates, interest rates on their deposit could be 1%. Or it could even be losing money mm. for having money in the bank. <laughs> Okay. Oh, yes. There are countries that if you have more than $5 million in the bank, you are paying interest for having that money. So there are policies to discourage you from having money. So some, some investment funds in that country are just looking for where to invest. But you see, they have to invest where they are stable. It's, the government really don't have to do so much except to create the enabling business environment. These funds were coming in their droves. We talk about the magic of Dubai. Mm. Yes, they have made their money, but 60% of investment that are there are from outside because it's a safe haven to invest. And some of those that are investing there are from Nigeria. Well, Niger oh yeah, Nigerians inclusive. If the best American hospital in Dubai, the German hospital in Dubai, those are, are hospitals invested by funds. I think uh, American hospital in Dubai is, is South African uh, investment from their th uh, pension fund. This is really where the money is coming from. So it's not necessarily government get money for this or government get money for that, but it's government making the right policy that will give investors the comfort and the confidence, the safety, not only physical, but the safety of the investment. Mm -hmm. You will have so much money flowing in here that this issue of US dollar foreign exchange will be a turn of the past. I've seen that happen. Mm -hmm. I've seen it even in America, you know, the, the huge, I remember the early days, you know, America was going up when we were still in secondary school. The Japanese were there. They are selling off everything to Japanese, to, to, to Japanese when the Japanese economy was growing. Today it's China. The recent huge investments in UK were not direct investment from the government. They were direct, they were investment from external investors because they found that place favorable and conducive for investment. So, the major tax for this government is creating conducive environment for investment to thrive. And we don't just have to be waiting for people to come from outside to show this. We have to start with the local investors that already have people like us, like in aviation sector. You stabilize what is going on. You make capital accessible, you know, and when you do that, the aviation world will look at how lucrative it is here in Nigeria 
and they will be coming. And you take another sector, you support them, and so on and so forth. So it should not just be rhetoric. It shouldn't be like, come to Nigeria, you will come regret it. But it's like, sin is believing. We've seen, I've seen that happen in this economy. Mm. Good number of my friends, having been a brain gain coming out from diaspora setting up in Nigeria, you know, I've given them shoulders to lean on coming in because they saw that I'm here, I'm surviving, I'm not ready to go anywhere. They came in their drawers with millions of dollars investment and I give them a whole lot of support. But you know, the bad news is that with what's going on the last few years, they've all moved back. They lost all the investment, they packed up and said, you know what, you know, I, I can take this. <laughs> well, you see, one of the things that the president is doing is trying to woo Nigerians out there to come back again. Great thing. No problem. It's, it's good that he's doing it. That's the job of a president. It's, he's doing it, he's doing his bit. But let's his team here be preparing the enabling environment for the people who are already here. Mm. It should be more effective for that Nigerian CEU surviving. It sends more practical message and they will come. But when they see Nigerians moving in droves and telling tales of words and asking them to come, it's going to be a hard decision for them to make. Mm. For tourism to thrive, we know that there has to be access. Access. I know one of the reasons that gave, one of the things that gave Imo State at that time um, strength was the roads that Sam Bakwe built. And some of those roads are still there, strong as ever. Mm -hmm. Now, do we have what it takes to revive our tourism? Because we have tourism, we have tourism in Nigeria. We have landmarks, we have history that people would want to come and learn about in our local communities. Obunike Cave, we have all of those things that people want to see. But do we have, are we open? And we, you mentioned aviation. The airlines are not, our ticket, I mean, we hear our airports are the most expensive. Tickets are expensive. The airports are expensive. And movement from the airports to those sites, there's no guarantee of safety. Uh, tourism is, is, um, is a great potential in this country, but we've not had an enabling environment to make the best use of it. You're right. You need the facilities, you need infrastructure. But first of all, um, internal and domestic tourism is the starting point. Until you are able to see Nigeria, a Nigerian living in Nigeria, move from Lagos to that Obonike cave, and so on and so forth, you have not started. You need to start practicing with it. Because these are people who tell the story. These are people who will expose what they see, you know, in this world of internet and social media, then other people will say. I remember growing up as a child, living in our nature. When we go to Enugu to see Mary go around the, the parks, it's a great it's a great thing for us. Those things are gone. We know that people move from here to Jaws, people move to Budura, even Nigerians. Those are potentials. And for that to happen, other supporting uh, uh, things like aviation and so on and so forth should be put in place. Because even if the, the tourism grows today, all the, the air transport, flying in and out of Nigeria, 99.5% of them will still go to foreign airline carriers. We have not been able to establish uh, uh, yeah, national flag fight. carriers. We don't need the oh. national carrier. We, well, there's, no really, there's no net carrier that is national. You know, British Airways is not even a national carrier. Lufthansa is not. United Airlines is not. It's no more modern in the aviation world for government to get involved. It's what they call national carrier, uh, and flag, flag, carrier. Flag, flag carriers, where you have investors, funds, you know, going into this. So, but the point is that if you have a, a, a flag carrier from this country, then come, you and come here, the tax you pay, the job you create. So, it's, we need to get that ready. We need to support the aviation industry. It goes a long way. In Egypt, for instance, their life is tourism. And then the, what propels 
the tourist industry is the aviation. Those who have their issues with forex, right? But but only aviation ministry issues of aviation and air force is one sector that has unlimited access to foreign exchange because they know the importance of it. Aviation is the catalyst for economic growth. The biggest thing that affected the whole world with regards to COVID was that you can't fly from one destination to other. But staying at home, doing your thing locally is really not the issue. It's just the, the air travel was shut down. That's the importance of it. It's important for you to know that the aviation in industry all over the world employs over 90 million people mm -hmm. and they run in about 30 something trillion worth. What is Nigerian share in that? So people like us, out of patriotism and commitment to add our vote quote to the economic growth, has stuck to this industry. We are talking before now, you know, they, there were no different breed of operators in the industry. I think we have new breed people who are able to articulate the problems of the industry and say it out. We are not just shouting for shouting's sake. We are just saying, hey, this is a hidden treasure. Let's understand it. Let Nigerian government bring this thing to an essential sector. Freight aviation, the way you look at agriculture, the way you look at uh, energy, the energy sector, and give them all the necessary attention that is required. Not money dash. We don't want, we're not asking for grants. But it's for us to be competitive, you need to accept capital. Because investment in aviation is huge. Buying aircraft, maintaining aircraft is a lot of money. And for you to compete, you are competing with operators from other parts of the world who have access to money at 2%. All right? I mean, we were discussing the last week there was a vision issue in Abuja. We had a roundtable discussion with somebody who was managing a, a bigger line overseas and he said that um, when his bank told him he had to pay 5% in his country, he took the word to the central bank of that country. How could he survive with 5%? <laughs> and that uh, he had a fleet of about 30 something aircraft. His insurance was costing him about $800,000 for the whole fleet in a, in, in a year. That's $800,000 is what you use to insure about three, three aircrafts operating in Nigeria. So how can we compete? How can we survive in that environment? You know, so it's an industry that needs to be looked at from a very, very, very strategic point of view and know that government needs to understand it better. And you know, we've had ministers who probably did not have a good understanding of industry and then did not do much to appreciate the problems. But I think that it's a sector that without it, let airlines not fly for 48 hours. There will be crisis in the country, you know that. Mm. And this even doesn't have to do with the, the bad shape of our roads or the insecurity in our roads because these countries that have developed their, their aviation and still using it effectively, they have the other form of transport system. If you go to UK, America, you can, you can transport yourself by train, by road, by Both. by any sport, but their vision remains solid. And again, it's still the safest way to travel. And so Nigerian aviation is very safe. So if, um, if you have a word of advice for two people now, those in government and policy makers, if you can do this in one or two minutes, that would be real good. Um, those in government and policy makers and the Nigerian people, what would it be? Well, I wouldn't really know because I've not gotten the appointment letter <laughs> as an advisor <laughs> until until I got it. Then uh, I will consider it. But I think that um, there's really no rocket science about all these things. The job of government is policy, 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 creating an enabling environment for things to happen. As long as that and as soon as that is done, you will see
things coming from all over the world. A typical example I give people. We had Niger, and for decades, the decades for all the money budget Nigeria put into telecommunication, Niger, we, they did not generate more than 20,000 lines nationwide. And then there was just a policy of government to have a GSM system. The same lighter, amongst the first winners of that license, was handed over a GSM license free of charge. Other bidders paid about 300 million US dollars. And they started to set up their infrastructure from zero. NITER did not survive. Government has no business in business. It's just the right policy and the environment. And just look at how much that is bringing back to the economy. The telecom sectors are paying trillions, generating added so much to our GDP. Look at the banking sector. It took a policy of government to say, recapitalize bank to 25 billion. Just a policy, government invested nothing. Just that policy, our banks recapitalized, they became bigger, do bigger businesses. Look at what the, the, the banking industry before the last administration was really going, going blazes, you know, doing very well, big jobs and so on and so forth. None of those things took government investment. It was just policy. So it's a typical example that the right policy the right environment, everything will prosper. And for Nigerian people, we must not despair. I know things are tough. It's telling everywhere. But you see, a lot of people are moving with the new slogan now in Japan, right? The people, uh, the before our army was I'm checking out, you know, remember the Andrew thing? Andrew, yeah. Now, it's a different thing altogether. I don't blame them. But the point is that we're here. Some people, the world is a global village. Be wherever you are, but we have, we've chosen to be here to fight the battle. And for us who are here, we need to know how to hold the government more accountable. Because, and we should know that because somebody is a minister, because somebody is a governor, because somebody is National Assembly overnight, does not mean that he knows everything. Mm -hmm. It does not mean he has solution to all the problems. We need to be involved. We need to be involved, whether you are invited, whether they like it or not, they have to find a way to be involved. That's why people like us who are not only facing business, but paying attention to politics around us. So let's work up. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be Thank here. You, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. That's our program today. We would like to hear from you via our social media handles. They are right there on your screen. You can also listen to this episode and previous episodes of the show via our podcast. Just visit our website, channelstv.com forward slash podcast to get started. I'm Neo Taigwe, and I look forward to hearing from you. Till then, bye-bye.